Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Hamid Elmir, and I am the host of podcast with Dr. E. At this podcast, I sit with the world's experts in health, education, and community development to talk about current health challenges and ask them to share their experiences, knowledge, and thoughts with all nations across the world, especially developing countries, so that we can learn from experts across the globe. I have a wonderful guest today who is a pediatrician, a researcher, and a global health expert. It is my pleasure to speak with Dr. Hamish Graham today. Thank you for your time, Dr. Hamish. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Dr. Hamish Graham is a consultant pediatrician and a research fellow at the uh, Royal Children's Hospital and Center for International Child Health, University of Melbourne. He spent one year at Johns Hopkins University in the, United, in the United States as a Fulbright Scholar. He completed his PhD at the University of Melbourne in collaboration with University College Hospital, Ebadan. Dr. Graham is a collaborative clinician researcher with interests in improving the quality of care for children, pulse oximetry and oxygen therapy, understanding refugee health and developmental issues, and developing models for of care for children and chronic health conditions. Dr. Graham currently leads multi-country projects on child pneumonia and oxygen therapy, mostly in Africa, and a child disability support project in Afghanistan. He works with health World Health Organization, Save the Children, among others. In a moment, we will find out more about his work. Welcome to the show, Dr. Hamish. Thank you, thank you. The world needs to collaboratively work on health uh, crisis by exchanging of ideas, skills, and knowledge. Find solutions to health problems and how we address the world's health issues today will have massive implications for the future. Undoubtedly, global health experts like yourself, Dr. Hamish, play a very important role in saving lives across the globe. Dear audience, the goal of my podcast is to highlight the experiences of those confronting public health issues, including this pandemic and its socioeconomic implications, and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can help control coronavirus and find solutions for health problems. I strongly believe these discussions and insights of world's renowned leaders in public health should be shared broadly. And thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Hamish, let's start with you telling us about what made you interested in global health. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I grew up in, in a rural part of Australia, a little island called Tasmania. Um, and I think from early on, I had, I had a very strong awareness that there are a lot of things in the world that were, were not equal, um, that by privilege of, of birth or, or socioeconomic class, uh, some people had a lot more advantages in, in life uh, and particularly around health. And my mum was a, a nurse. Um, my dad worked in agriculture. So as I grew up around, around farms and around nurses, I developed more and more of an interest in, in health and health, how health connected with what we ate and, and how we lived in the world. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that, that really sparked my interest. I had some really formative uh, experiences as a, as a young person going on a student exchange uh, uh, overseas, doing some health placements while I was a medical student uh, in, in India. Uh, met some very inspirational um, people, people whose sort of stories really influenced how I thought about um, health and how I thought about uh, global development and um, uh, relationships between different countries, different groups of people. And yeah, I guess my, my understanding of global health has, has evolved um, over time, but certainly I think your words about partnership is, is right on. It's all about partnerships. I think there's often a misconception that, you know, experts in high income countries can come to low income countries and, and somehow, you know, share their expertise, but that's, that's definitely got things upside down as I think probably coronavirus has really shown us. Absolutely. And this pandemic, as you just mentioned, um, shown us how, how we can actually, um, we really need uh, collaborative work, not only in health, but also, you know, in all challenges across the world that um, as human beings, we are all um, suffering uh, from the same issues, um, more or less. 
So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I know that we also met first uh, back in Afghanistan. Um, that was a while ago. And um, don't remember exactly the year, but you probably remember that. That shows how you were interested in global health. And uh, as a physician, when you came there, um, when I was doing my residency at the, one of the pediatrics hospitals, and um, we met there first time. And that's, uh, we, it's really important to keep professional relationship and friendly relationship um, in, in this world, especially that um, as health professionals, uh, we really need to have more uh, exchanging of ideas and thoughts and, and sharing the challenges across the world so that we can come to, uh, um, you know, find solutions for it. Um, yes. Yeah, as, absolutely. No, I remember that. Well, I think it was seven or eight years ago. Um, I was there as a, as a student, as a public health uh, student, uh, working with some colleagues in the Ministry of Public Health around how uh, paediatric and maternity guidelines were being used in hospitals. So I think I uh, interviewed you and a, a bunch of your paediatric colleagues and nursing colleagues and midwifery uh, colleagues. And yeah, I certainly learnt a lot. That was, um, I think, my second visit to Kabul, to Afghanistan, but learnt a lot um, and yeah, really, really valued that connection that we've had since then. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Well, thank you. And, uh, and it was a, my pleasure. I, I, I learned a lot from you as well. And as a global health uh, researcher and practitioner, how important do you, do you find global collaboration on mitigation of pandemics such as uh, COVID-19? Um, I think it's extremely important, um, but not just for mitigating pandemics. I think this is something which um, hopefully the world and the global health and global health research and practice community will really take away from the coronavirus experience because um, really global collaboration on, on all our big health issues um, and even more broadly on all our uh, uh, and many other issues uh, is really important and, and a true collaboration, not, I guess, as we were I was alluding to earlier, not the not the idea that you know we're taking um, knowledge and expertise to you, or that one group of people has um, a, a particular you know a particular monopoly on knowledge or, or understanding, but a real collaboration where we're recognising the the knowledge that comes from all different experiences. Absolutely, um, that that's a very important. Uh word that you used, uh, real collaborative uh, collaboration. And um, I think um, there are some, you know, some kind of collaborations based, based on, um, you know, as, as people say, it's uh, based on, it's on the paper, actually, it really doesn't happen sometimes. Um, and um, in this podcast that I um, actually started in the wake of COVID-19, um, is uh, the purpose is also to bring people to people and have that real connection and real exchanging of ideas and, and sharing thoughts and, and how we can find solutions for the uh, health issues across the world. Um, not to just have something on the paper and, and um, just forget about it. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. And um, it's, it's really um, important. Um, so Australia, as I mentioned that the um, COVID-19 is um, was or this coronavirus is actually um, um, you know it happens across the world now and um, a lot of people have suffered and you know different countries are at different levels um, during this time like Afghanistan is unfortunately in probably uh, in its peak and um, Australia on the other hand is um, is in a better condition now and uh, situation and Australia was uh, among the few countries that controlled coronavirus at an earlier stage. Could you tell us about current situations of COVID-19 in Australia? Yeah, certainly. I think it's it's been um, yeah a bit surreal sometimes to hear experiences from from different places, from Afghanistan, from Nigeria, where I work, from the US, where where you're uh, sitting, mm -hmm. um, because in Australia it has been yeah a bit of a a unique experience and I think there's some things that we as a country and as a public health sort of leadership have have done well but um, most of them has just been has been just some of the real 
fundamentals and doing them in a timely sort of way. So we had, um, Australia had its first coronavirus case confirmed in late January, mm -hmm. but it was really March where we saw a big upturn from just a, a handful of cases a day mm -hmm. to peaking at 400 new cases a day. Um, and at that stage, there was a lot of debate uh, internally about how effective our response was being. Our we have a, a good public health um, system and good public health doctors, but they were very uh, under-resourced for, for this sort of task. Mm. Um, but we did have a few things going in our favour. Um, one is that our region had, had relatively recent experience with the previous SARS um, epidemic. Um, and so there had been some preparedness and some thinking around um, that. Um, secondly, we've got a really pretty strong public health system. So when we needed to rapidly scale up things like testing, when we needed to you know, make sure hospitals could be mobilized, then that could be done probably pretty efficiently, maybe compared to more of a privatized um, health system uh, and we're obviously an, an island so it's it's possible for us to physically shut off borders quite effectively um, so what Australia did early or in in March was set up a national cabinet um, to bring all the states together all the health experts together and um, probably if there's been one distinguishing thing from this it's been that the the governments, both state and federal government, have listened to the health experts, um, which is perhaps what hasn't happened so effectively in some other places. Um, we weren't particularly quick at shutting our borders. It took us till the end of March to close our borders, but um, that was a very important move. Uh, and then we took on various other things around particularly uh, spatial distancing. Um, and I think the population it took it up probably as well as you could expect. And indeed, even before the rules came in, people were changing their behavior because we saw what was happening in other places, particularly in, in Italy um, and China. Um, so at the moment, we're actually back down to, uh, we haven't eliminated uh, coronavirus, but it's, I guess it's in our sights. I think at the, the last numbers I was checking this morning, we had, had about um, uh, 100 deaths in total. Um, and virtually all of them were older adults. So the vast majority were over sort of 75 years of age. Um, we've done over 2 million tests, which for a population of 25 million is a lot of tests um, with, a, with a positive test um, ratio of 0.4%. So I guess we're pretty confident that we're doing widespread testing and getting most of the confirmed cases. Um, Still in the in the state that I'm in, there has been some community transmission just in the in the last few weeks, so there has been a, a step back up with some of the restrictions. Um, but I think we're we're cautiously hopeful that we'll be able to eliminate community transmission, uh, open our society up back to pretty normal levels, um, and then be able to control in imported cases and any sort of clustering in a really targeted way. Um, yeah, so we're in a, a quite a nice position uh, at the moment, but I think it was largely due to a lot of the work done just as things were kicking off and our advantage of being able to learn quickly from what other places were, were doing. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, um, I think this is, um, a tough time for some of the countries like Afghanistan. They don't have really, um, you know, a stable kind of um, public health uh, infrastructure, and it the uh, health system is really fragile. Um, that gives them a very hard time to to fight with uh, coronavirus. And um, you know, on the other hand, as you know about Afghanistan, that they, we are all still str uh, struggling with some other infectious diseases um, such as polio is still there and you work also in Nigeria that is um, you know one of the countries Afghanistan and Pakistan the three countries in the world that uh, are still suffering from um, polio and yep. uh, measles is still in Afghanistan um, uh, during this time of pandemic uh, where all the focus is now on coronavirus and I think it's also very challenging for for some of the um, you know communities there that they're um, they're suffering from other infectious diseases, as I said, like even people who are working as CHWs or community health workers in rural Afghanistan to find the 
um, polio cases and as well as like you know helping people with other infectious diseases they are they are also focusing on coronavirus so uh, that later on i'll ask you also about your um, thoughts about you know how can Afghanistan can learn from australia but uh, but before that um, since you are a global health expert um, and uh, you have actually been working at different uh, different countries with different organizations um, let me ask you um, that um, you've been working on various projects through WHO and UNICEF. Um, could you tell us uh, what are you currently focusing on? Yeah, sure. So um, for the last um, five or six years, a lot of my work has focused around child pneumonia uh, and particularly the provision of oxygen therapy. So pulse oximetry to detect children, uh, patients that have low blood oxygen levels and oxygen for those that um, need treatment. Um, and so most of my research has been based in Nigeria, uh, a little bit of uh, work in a, a couple of other countries, and really trying to get some of the, like we we've, we've know that oxygen is important, we know that oxygen um, is uh, a, an essential medicine, it's on the WHO essential medicines list. Uh, it's been around for over a century, mm-hmm. and yet when you walk into most district hospitals in Nigeria um, and similarly in Afghanistan and in fact in in most lower and lower middle income countries Mm -hmm. um, the pediatric wards don't have access to oxygen the the pediatric nurses um, don't have pulse oximeters to to do this basic assessment on on children Uh, and we know that it is it is costing lives particularly with child pneumonia but also with other conditions Um, so what, what we did initially in, in Nigeria was work with the University College Hospital Libadan and a, a group of 12 district hospitals uh, to find ways to improve the way they provided oxygen to children. Um, and we got some really nice results. And I, I guess coronavirus has really raised oxygen as a, as a global issue in a way that it hasn't before. Right. Um, I think we've probably been talking about it uh, more and more in the, the child pneumonia community, but now suddenly uh, it's important for, for adults who are dying from coronavirus. Um, so that's that's meant that we've been able to, um, yeah, I, I, I guess see a, a big shift um, and, a, and a lot of the work coming out of UNICEF and WHO over the last w- few years around oxygen has really had a, suddenly got a really big audience um, uh, now. Um, so that's that's been uh, one big part of my work. And then in terms of Afghanistan specifically, we've been working with a local uh, group in Afghanistan to try and set up some some work for children living with disability. So specifically around supporting mothers and care, carers of children living with disability. Uh, and that's a bit on hold at the moment because uh, we can't bring parents together. <laughs> um, but we're keen to start that back up once things things open up. It's obviously a a really important area and something which is very close to my heart. Well, thank you for um, mentioning that. Um, and uh, Afghanistan is having a hard time in terms of um, not only you know the infectious diseases, but um, in general, preventative measures is is not as strong there um, as. You, you, you saw me there at that hospital where I was uh, doing my residency in pediatrics, and you, um, you've probably, uh, you probably remember the number of patients that they were coming at the OPD. Um, yeah. And I think um, we still are having uh, a big problem in terms of seeing patients, uh, OPD patients. And um, this is a point that I really uh, wanted to mention a quick um, story that, um, when when I was working back in Afghanistan, I um, uh, beside my residency, I was also working at uh, another international hospital where I was community health uh, coordinator for a for a project, and um, we were also teaching um, something called a uh, TOT or a training of trainers. This story is uh, called expert and expert. And um, you as a global health and someone as new clinical side of it, and you've been also on the public health side of it. Um, me, pretty much the same, like, you know, when I was working at a hospital and uh, we were training people about this expert and expert, there was uh, a, a young, 
you know, medical student who wanted to be a physician. And uh, he, his goal was to help people. So he becomes a physician uh, and uh, he goes to a rural area somewhere. Um, then he starts seeing patients and as he sees patients, he gives real time in, in you know, asking people's uh, problems and taking a good history, medical history and all that. Um, long story short, uh, he becomes very popular there and a lot of people get well and uh, they tell the other members of the, you know, their families, community members. And so this physician is new in our community and he sees us well, like, you know, he gives us good medication and all that. But then the next day, um, you know, the number increases and it, uh, if it, it, it doubles and then he sees them, then he has to skip his lunch break. So the next day, more people come in it, it uh, you know, the triple number, and uh, he has to, you know, continue an hour longer. And, and as the number grows, then he really, um, people start, you know, they're in long lines, and then they keep saying that, well, you, ha you don't have to spend like that many uh, minutes with, with one patient asking him, you know, or her the questions. And um, then he, you know, he has to see like if he was given 20 minutes to a, to a patient, then he gives like 10 minutes to a patient. And then he says, um, so there are people like every day the number increases. And um, so finally he, he really can't find, he give up his break time, he give up his lunch time. He, um, he like, you know, he was seeing patient after patient and then um, so finally he says like next and next, next. So he was an expert, he becomes an expert, which, which that's the point of the story, expert and expert. Um, reason I brought this uh, story is that, you know, as physicians, we are always trying to help people and we really wanna go for the underlying causes and find, you know, uh, solutions and have to have a good, you know, medical, um, you, uh, uh, you know, personal history to find out the problem. But then problems like that, um, and this, and what I have experienced personally at that uh, hospital in pediatrics residency, that almost 60 to 70%, even more uh, of my patients at the OPD were patients who could be, their diseases could be easily preventable uh, at the community level and at their homes. And they were coming to a tertiary hospital uh, for, for let's say pneumonia or um, not even pneumonia, bron bronchitis or, or uh, diarrhea. And um, these, are, these are actually the, the major reasons that I try to go for the underlying causes and find those underlying causes why people are actually suffering in the first place. And they come to us at the hospital where uh, they, you know, they cannot even afford to buy their medications and they come in a critical condition uh, just because of a very easily preventable disease. And uh, I really appreciate your work in, you know, in global health and what you do and you're looking also for the underlying causes of all these health issues, uh, not only, you know, in the developing world, but also across the world. So thank you for, for that. We're getting close to the time, to the end of this podcast. Um, as an Australian physician and a public health expert um, who is familiar with the health systems in Afghanistan, in your opinion, what would be some lessons that Afghanistan can learn from Australia in, in order to control this coronavirus? To be honest, I'm really reluctant to, um, to, to foist my, my um, opinions on, on this because I think what we're really finding with coronavirus is the, the experience in particular communities, in particular countries, is very different and there's things that can be done in australia that can't be done in afghanistan like mm -hmm. close your borders um but there's also things that can be done in afghanistan that wouldn't be appropriate or you couldn't do in in australia um there's also the indirect effects of what we do so um i think it's becoming very very obvious that in in contexts where you've got high underlying child mortality and neonatal mortality and maternal mortality, um, there are enormous risks with closing down health systems and preventing people getting access to life-saving care um, and a real risk of losing 
many more lives to otherwise preventable causes, preventable causes that you were referring to, uh, than for coronavirus. So it's a, it's a, I guess a, a real balance, um, and that can really only come from from local answers. Um, I would say probably just a few general things. First is that um, every system has some strengths that you can build on. Um, I remember when I was in Afghanistan with, with you some years back, uh, one of the children's hospitals, I think it was Indira Gandhi Hospital, had just implemented the ETAT um, program. So emergency triage and treatment program. And this is not a revolutionary new approach, but it was a system to get the hospital doing the basics really well when sick patients came to the hospital. And I remember really moving stories about how patients would die in while they were waiting to even see a nurse or a doctor. But with the ETAT system in place, even the cleaners knew that, you know, a baby that was fitting could be brought to the front of the line and to see someone straight away. They had a system where they could start doing some of those basic things um, really well. Um, and for me, that's a big lesson out of coronavirus. And that's true for prevention, do the basics of prevention really well. It's true for treatment, do the basics of treatment really well and that's where a lot of my work is focused something as basic as as oxygen before we're thinking about ventilators and increasing icu capacity how about we get the the oxygen systems um uh right um because i really think it's it's doing those basics well all the time that'll be the real the real difference between between winning and and losing uh this challenge um as to how that translates into the Afghanistan context, then it'll probably be different between urban sort of Kabul area versus some of the more remote and uh, provinces that are, are very difficult for government groups to, to access. Um, I don't really know. I'd love to learn from, from you, you and other colleagues on, on how that works. Um, but yeah, I think if we can have individualized approaches that are aware of not just coronavirus, but all the other stuff that's going on, that build on the strengths of the systems that we already have uh, and that concentrates on doing the basics really well rather than getting carried away with sort of high end um, or quick fixes, then, uh, then that'd be, that'd go a long way. Well, thank you for sharing your insights on this. And I totally agree with you with, uh, you know, with the two countries having different health settings and different um, infrastructures. Um, but uh, there are some common things, as you just mentioned also, when it comes to the third world as uh, uh, so-called, which I really do, don't agree with um, this terminology of second and third world or first world, um, but the developing countries, I always insist on awareness. I think um, in, especially with this pandemic, uh, public awareness and health literacy is really important, more important than any time before and this is um that really doesn't need to a lot of you know uh, investment and and we don't need all the equipment and tools as you said like the ventilators and i was uh, when i first heard about uh, coronavirus um and uh, the first uh, case which was actually reported from afghanistan that was early february sometime and i started um talking about coronavirus and i was you know through different social media platforms as well as you know, now this podcast and um, I had interviews on other, I appeared actually on different shows uh, to talk about this and raise awareness. And I think that is very important. Um, so people can look, can know about the, the magnitude of this problem and uh, how, how, you know, the, the, the transmissibility of this virus is really um, different than so many other uh, coronaviruses. And um, people have to keep that social distancing, as you mentioned. Uh, they still need to, you know, wear masks and, and um, if possible, quarantining. Which, uh, again, in Afghanistan, it's a little difficult because of the all the, you know, socioeconomic uh, burdens and implications of this coronavirus. A lot of people are actually living on day-to-day -day life. I mean, wages. They have to go out for, in order to survive. But um, I would really encourage the um, people, if they are going out, they have to keep that uh, social distancing and um, also wearing masks uh, and avoiding uh, actually crowds. And 
thank you again, Dr. Hamish, uh, very much for your time today. Um, it was a pleasure to um, talk with you today, and I, I um, um, think it was like, as you said, like a few years um, later, and when we first met in person. So thank you again for your time. Thank you, and I just really, really want to congratulate you on doing this. I think you're absolutely right that um, clear communication and consistent communication is probably the most important thing in, in a pandemic response. Uh, and we do know there's a lot of misinformation, uh, uh, a lot of strange and wacky theories, a lot of you know miracle cures being promised. But to be able to yeah really reinforce those key messages that you you've just been speaking about hand washing spatial distancing not going out and unless you really really have to you know wearing a mask um yeah those are the key messages that need to keep coming across loud and clear so thank you well thank you again and dear audience um for more amazing people and and guests uh, coming on uh talking about the current health challenges across the world please uh, stay tuned with uh, the podcast with Dr. E. Thank you, Dr. Hamish, again. Thank you. Bye.